So I'd like it if you'd take your Bibles and read with me Luke chapter 18. For your convenience, I've put it on the screen behind me, but if you do have a Bible, it would be great to open that up. You can follow along throughout the message this morning. So, it says, And he, which is Jesus, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I'll give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So, as we look at this passage, we see that Luke is starting off giving a commentary to the story that Jesus tells. And he says, the whole point is to pray and not give up. And so uh, you see Dorian Nemo there. If you've seen the movie, you know, the whole comes to the climax of just got to keep swimming. You got to keep swimming. You got to keep going. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is saying. He says, pray and don't give up. Persevere in your prayer. Continue on in your prayer. Be diligent in your prayer and faithful in your prayer. Pray and don't give up. Just keep on praying. And so as we look at this persistence that Jesus is instructing us towards, what is persistence anyway? Um, I think there could be good persistence or there could be bad persistence, depending on what you're going towards. So you've got this guy, and he asks this girl out on a date, and she says no. The next week, he asks her out on a date again. She says no. And then she's going for a walk down the road, and turns out he's on the same path as her. Or she's out for lunch with some friends, and ta-da, he's in the same restaurant, and everywhere the girl is, the guy happens to show up. Persistent? Yes. But also creepy, right? (laughs) We call him a stalker. And so uh, that's persistence. Kids, though. Kids are the best at persistence. I remember junior high, we're driving down the road. Dad, can we stop at McDonald's? No. Next time. Dad, can we stop at McDonald's? No. Dad, can we stop at McDonald's? No. I don't know who was more persistent, me or my dad. Every now and then we'd win out, but more often than not. But kids, especially in the supermarket, they know about persistence, especially because they've got you in that hostage situation, right? They know the crowds are watching. They say, I want the Skittles. And they know if you say no, they've got a few kind of negotiation tactics can lay on the floor and flop. You can scream. You can act as if you've been beat or abused. And eventually, kids, they'll keep on asking and asking and trying all their tactics until it pays off. Persistence. Kids are experts at that. And then there's a good form of persistence, right? Like in marriage. For better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. Now, the the richer part the health part, the better part. You don't really need persistence for those. You just kind of carry on in your marriage. But what about the worse, or the poorer, or the, or the sickness part? That's when persistence really comes into play, right? Or it says, I'm going to put your needs above my own. With the poorer part of we're going to gather together and we're going to struggle together and we're going to keep on loving each other despite these times. The poor health part, the sickness part, I'm going to put aside my own agenda, my own life, my own hobbies to put you first and to care for you. And persistence in marriage we see as a beautiful thing. And so Jesus is pulling out this word of, of carrying on, of keep on. And he's talking about prayer and he says, keep on praying. And so, as Jesus always does, he tells a story. And Jesus is good at telling stories, right? And so he says, in order to pray and not give up, he tells this story. And it's about a widow. And the widow, we don't know if she's elderly. Maybe she's already a senior citizen and her husband has passed away and she's left with nothing. Maybe she's just still a teenager. Kid. 13, 14 years old, often got married, the girls in their society at that time. So she might have been married five or six years already, still been a teenager, and her husband passes away. She doesn't have grown kids to take care of her. 
Um, she doesn't, being a woman in that society isn't able to own property, isn't able to vote. Things are all stacked against her. And then she has an adversary, right? Someone is against her. Someone is doing something and she wants justice because she wants the wrongs to be made right. And this adversary, we don't know what it is, if it's some sort of criminal activity, if it's an abuse, or if it's just withholding the money that she or her late husband was owed. We don't know what it is, but she's in trouble. She's got this adversary that's against her, and so she goes to the judge. She has no other options. She goes to the judge. She pleads her case of, give me justice gets from my adversary. Now, in the time when Jesus told this story, there was no kind of uniform judicial system in Palestine. Often it would just be, here's a prominent man in the village, and all the disputable matters go towards him. He probably had some money, he probably had some connections, maybe family ties to King Herod or whatever it was that gave him that position. And she comes to this judge, except Jesus kind of gives a character report on this judge. He says that he doesn't fear God, and he doesn't respect people. Now, if there were to be a couple criteria to be a good judge, you think those would be some of them, right? To fear God. If you fear God, then you know there's a law above you. You're not a law unto yourself. You don't get to make all the decisions on your own, but you care about justice because God is a just judge. And yet, this judge, he doesn't fear God. He's a law unto himself. He could care less what anyone else thinks. And then, he also doesn't care about people. He doesn't respect people. Now, if his mom came to him, he might be like, sure, I'll give you justice because you're mom and I care about you. But anyone else, he's like, your problems? Whatever. Deal with it. You're on your own. Your concerns? Pfft, not my concerns. Like, why are you coming to me? And so, kind of on the prerequisites for this judge, he's hitting zero out of two. And so this widow is in a tough spot because all she has is to come to him and to plead her case. And he's sitting there behind his desk and he's writing things and she says, I've got this adversary. Please, I ask for justice. He brushes her off and says, sorry, can't help you. Next. What? Like, you, you didn't even hear me out here. Nope, next. Can't help you. She comes back in another time. Please, give me justice against my adversary. Nope, nothing I can do to help you. And she's up, all odds against her. And she's coming to this judge, and he keeps brushing her off. Now, when Jesus is talking about prayer, especially persisting in prayer, if the judge answered her on her first time and gave her a fair trial and gave her justice, would there be any need for persistence? Of course not. Persistence comes in the midst of unanswered prayers. In those hardest times where... She's in a vulnerable state in society. People are against her. She doesn't have the capability to do things. And then she comes to this judge, and the judge isn't listening. It's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Everything's against you. You don't see a way forward. You don't know what's coming. You don't know how you're going to accomplish anything. You've been asking, but there's no answer, and you get discouraged. You get discouraged, you feel like quitting. You lose faith, you lose heart. And yet it, Jesus is saying, this is the time to pray. I know in, amidst all the discouragement, I know amidst all the cloudiness of I don't know what's happening, pray. And then keep on praying. And then persist in your prayers and don't give up because it's in that time that you need to pray. Finally, she goes to the judge courtroom isn't working, so she tries. He's out for lunch with his friends and colleagues. Excuse me, sir. I've got this matter of justice. I'd like you to hear me. He's off at a dinner party. Uh, pardon me. I'd like to, you to hear about my case of justice. He's about to board the, lot, uh, the yacht with his friends, and there she is at the dockyard. And, excuse me, sir, please, just hear my case. And he's sitting on the yacht. He's scratching his head, and he's going, this lady's wearing me out. So, it says in our English version, version here that the, she keeps bothering me. I'll give her justice so she won't beat me down with her continued coming. Literally, Jesus said, used a phrase, she's going to give me a black eye. Like, 
she's going to come against me, her persistence, her pestering, her bothering me. Everywhere I go, everywhere I look, she's going to give me a black eye. And I don't know if he was like scared because she was intimidating, this little widow lady, or if it was just a phrase like, man, she's giving me a headache and I can't take it anymore. And so fine, I'm going to grant her justice. Her persistence pays off, right? Again and again and again until finally he throws up his hands and says, fine, you win. Just I don't ever want to see you again. That's the story that Jesus tells. And then Jesus says, listen to the judge. Hear the words of this unrighteous, unjust judge. Because we're to listen up because Jesus does a little bit of a compare and contrast things. If we have this judge who isn't just, if we have this judge who isn't righteous, he doesn't fear God, he doesn't care about people, and that judge listens to persistence, how much more will God listen? Right? You see that. If this unrighteous judge listens, how much more this God will listen? And he's appealing to the character of God, who God is. Because God is different than this unrighteous judge. God is righteous. God is just. God cares about people. God is gracious. And so Jesus wants us to think about the character of God here. And as we think about prayer and carrying on and persisting in our prayers, Jesus wants to draw attention to the character of God. And it, it always comes back to that this question of who God is. And knowing who God is is going to have great implications in every area of our life. So knowing who God is, how will that affect our prayers? Well, first of all, we won't have to kind of appease God. If God is some angry God who's, who's upset and he's out to get us, well, that would be scary. And we'd have to do everything possible to appease him. To keep God on our good side so that God doesn't flare up in anger and all of a sudden send bad things our way. And so if we had this view of God that was more he's this angry God and he's wanting us to do right, then it's like, okay, God, what are your requirements? And I'll meet all of those to keep you off my back. You want me to make sure I attend at least 40 church services every year? I'll do it as long as it keeps you happy, God. Right? Uh, you want me to give a certain amount of money? Okay, if, if I want my prayers answered, well then, I'd better at least probably volunteer for something in the church so that I get on God's good books, and then he'll listen to... Like, you get what I'm saying, right? We don't have to appease God because God is a gracious God. Where God loves to hear our prayers, to answer our prayers, where we don't have to prove ourselves to him, but he has given us willfully his own son, Jesus. But even when we are enemies with God, he sent Jesus to die for us, to take away our sin. And so we don't have to appease God. Next thing we don't have to do is this vain repetition to try and coerce God into something. Persistence is different than repetition, right? Like persistence you can ask again and again and again, day after day, month after month, year after year. And then there's repetition. Like what if, if your kids came to you and said, I'd really like some ice cream. It's a hot day out and ice cream is cold. So please, can we have ice cream? I like ice cream because it's freezing. I like ice cream because it's frozen. I like ice cream because it's chilled. And I like ice cream because it's frosty. I like ice cream because it cools me down. And you'd start going after a little while, like put the thesaurus away and uh, just ask in a normal way if you want ice cream, right? And I'll probably give it to you. But after you start doing this repetition thing that's just weird. And in our prayers, we don't have to have this big thesaurus and impress God and find special ways. And what's the, just the right way to ask this? We can come to God as our Father. And Jesus says, what kind of Father, if you ask him for a fish, will give you a stone or, or a scorpion or something like that? Like God's a good God and he wants to give good gifts. The book of James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father. And so God loves to give good gifts. And one more note on out of the character of God and how that forms our prayers. The word just. If I were to say, on my Christmas list, I'm just going to ask for a gift certificate to Mech. How many things am I asking for? One, right? I'm, the word just implies that you only want to ask one thing. Now, our view of God. If God is a very busy God, 
And he doesn't really care about all the petty matters of our lives and the things that we're facing. Then when we pray, it feels like we're interrupting him. And so then we'll say, God, I just have this one thing to ask. I know you're busy, and, and, but this one thing I just want to ask, and we'll put in our request, and then we'll back off so that we don't have to interrupt this God. And yet that's not God at all. And I don't want to pick on our prayers because we're people who pray and we want to pray, but sometimes we fall into these patterns of speech, right? And sometimes it's just a pattern of speech, but sometimes it's coming out of our view of God. We don't have to say, God, I just ask for this, and I just ask for that, and then I just ask for this, and oh, and I have thought of something else. I'm just going to ask for that too, because God's a gracious God. And God's arms are open wide saying, come, you've got a list a mile long? That's okay, because the things that you care about, I care about. And as we understand God's character and how that forms our prayers, and we understand the things that he cares about, we begin to care about those things, and we bring those requests to God. God is gracious and loving and caring. And so knowing who God is, knowing his character, helps form our prayers. And that's why my next point is that prayer comes from faith. Because the more we know God, the more confident we can be to pray. The more we understand God's power and might, the more we can say, yeah, I want to bring my requests to God. The more we understand God's love and grace towards us, it just opens us up to say, I want to come before him. And then we see how God gave us his son Jesus to open up the way to take away our sin by Jesus being a substitute on the cross so that we can enter the very throne of God with a boldness and a confidence to go, yes, here we are standing before the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And we can pray and we can pray and we can keep on praying. Now, prayer comes from faith, but prayer also builds our faith. And sometimes when we recognize that prayer comes from faith, we look at ourselves and go, I'm not quite there yet. Now, if I were you and I were to sit down this morning and the preacher guy comes up front and says, today we're talking about prayer, you start to squirm in your seat a little bit, right? Because I know prayer is a good thing. I know God wants us to pray, and I, I do pray, but I don't quite pray as much as I know that I, I could or I should, and we feel inadequate in our prayer lives. Um, our whole Western Christianity, an epidemic problem of not coming to God in prayer, often because we've got our own confidence. We, we can do this. We can achieve. We have resources and gifts and talents, and, and we can make things happen. And Well, maybe if we get stuck, then we'll pray. And sometimes we have this mentality that prayer is for the spiritual heavyweights, right? They, they can do it because they have achieved this certain level of faith, and they're the ones who pray. And we admire those people that we hear praying. We spend, they spend time in prayer. But prayer isn't for the spiritual elite. Why do you think Jesus used an example of a widow? The most vulnerable person in society. The person with the least resources. The person who throws up her hands in despair and says, I can do absolutely nothing. All I have is to plead before the judge for justice. Prayer is for the weak, right? And sometimes we know that, yeah, prayer comes from faith, but prayer also builds our faith. Because it, maybe my faith is only like that big. Like it's not even the size of a mustard seed. So I know I'm not going to move mountains or anything like that. But God doesn't matter mind so much the quantity of our faith, but the direction of it. So if I have just a little bit of faith, but I'm coming to God in that faith, God, the creator over all, the one who sustains the universe, that little bit of faith is enough because its direction is towards God. It's the object of our faith that matters. And so when I bring my small amount of faith and I pray and then God does what God does and he answers my prayer, next time aren't I going to be a little bit more confident and say, yeah, I'm going to pray again. Because God answered me last time. And, and perpetually the cycle grows. And so prayer starts building our faith where it's like, I'm just not there. I just don't do it. And we start praying. And then all of a sudden the growth begins. So if you're feeling discouraged in your life of prayer, don't let that stop you from praying. First of all, because God's grace is there and he says, you know what? Come to me. I want to hear you. 
I love you. He's given us his son. The work on the cross has already been complete and finished. And so don't allow discouragement to bring you down. If the widow went to the judge and after time one or two got discouraged and quit, like what kind of story would that be? We, we probably wouldn't be reading it because we'd be like, oh, here's the negative example. Don't be discouraged and not pray. If you're discouraged, allow that to lead you before God and allow that to start a prayer life and a routine and a way of praying that will keep on praying. Persistent prayer. Keep on praying. That comes as we know God and his character and understanding his grace and his power and his care for people. But what are we to pray for? The next couple of verses bring us into that. It talks a lot about justice. Um, he says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? When I first read the parable, I knew it, Luke gives the commentary. Jesus says, pray and don't give up. So here's the story. And in the story, the example is justice. And I thought, well, praying for justice is just a good example to make the point of persistence. But then Jesus goes on and he begins to elaborate and he's like, pray for justice. If you're praying for justice, God will hear and God will answer speedily. And then he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And that's the question in our series that we're working towards. Will the Son of Man find faith on earth? And this phrase, Son of Man, shows that it's already part of a larger conversation. If you turn back in your Bible, just one page, to Luke 17, starting in chapter 20, there's this whole conversation about the Son of Man coming. So when Jesus is talking about prayer, and when Jesus is talking about persisting in prayer, it's part of a larger conversation. We jumped in just kind of halfway through. So I want to back up to the beginning of the conversation where the Pharisees start asking Jesus about this kingdom. They're wondering when the kingdom of God is going to come. So Jesus talks to the Pharisees and he's like, well, the kingdom of God, it's not really something that you can observe where you're like, oh, look, here it is. The kingdom's amongst us or the kingdom is within you. Because what do we know about every kingdom? Every kingdom has a king, right? And so here's Jesus come to this earth and he will be king forever. The king is amongst them. And as his rule begins to rule, his kingdom has come, his kingdom is near. And then Jesus carries on the conversation because God's kingdom has come, it's near, and yet there's a time where we're going to fully realize this kingdom. Jesus describes it as when the Son of Man returns. When Jesus returns, there's going to be a time where we see this. And Jesus begins to talk to his disciples and explain it a little bit more. First of all, he says... The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, when Jesus returns, everybody's going to know it. It's not going to be this hidden event that we're going to have to speculate. Did it happen or didn't it happen? Just like when lightning lights up the sky... Even if you're not looking, boom, you see it out of the corner of your eye, right? You know that it happened. When Jesus returns, when the Son of Man returns, it's going to be evident towards all. And then Jesus describes a little. Well, first he says, but first, he's going to have to suffer and be rejected by that generation. So the, the whole payment of the cross to inaugurate that kingdom will have to happen first. Then Jesus describes the days leading up and the circumstances leading up to this. He says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood, and the flood came and destroyed them all. So here you've got everyone just carrying on in regular life. They're eating and they're drinking, they're planning their dinner parties, they're getting married, they're planning their lives, and then BAM! The flood comes. It's all over. Then Jesus says, and when the Son of Man comes, it's going to be like the time of Lot. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. 
so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. They're building and they're planning their portfolios and they're selling their fields and they're working on their business and they're doing everything else and then bam, again, fire and sulfur rain down. Everyone's destroyed. So Jesus is talking about the immediacy. When Jesus returns one day, it's not going to be like, ah, oh, I can kind of see it's coming. Let's just decide to get ready now. No, it's just going to happen. It's going to be there. We're going on with our regular lives. And then, boom, he's there. And it's interesting how Jesus kind of describes the circumstances at the time of Noah and the time of Lot. Because if you go back to Genesis and you read about Noah and you read about Lot, it talks about the specific sins of their culture and their time and the moral decay. It talks about every inclination of their heart is on evil all the time. It talks about sexual perversity. It talks about just the horrible things that were happening in their culture and the decay that was happening around them. And here Jesus describes it as they're just off eating and drinking. They're just getting married and buying houses and selling fields. They're just carrying on with their regular life. And I think it connects because the next couple verses, Jesus says, anyone who wants to gain his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will gain it. All these people in the time of Noah and the time of Lot, they're just thinking about life. How can I gain life? How can I accumulate things? What about me? How can I make things work out for me so that I can have the best life that I can have? And we see how that played out for itself in Genesis, right? If your focus is, how can I gain my life? You're going to try so hard to gain your life, but soon morals are going to go out the window. Soon society is going to start to go downhill. Soon there's going to be a turning away from God and everything is going to go south there. And Jesus says, that's what it's going to be like when he returns. People are going to be trying to gain their own lives, but really, they're losing their soul. But for those people who give up their lives, who say, I can't do this. I'm in this desperate state. I can't accomplish it on my own. We have Jesus who gave up his life for us. That substitute where we've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer us who live. We've given that up, but now he lives in us and we gain life. So that's the backdrop to what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about prayer. And then Jesus says, if you're praying for justice, God will answer you. And God will answer you speedily. Pray for justice. Now, when we think about Jesus returning one day, and we think about a whole culture that's ignored God, they're just trying to accumulate life for themselves, and they've turned away from God, what's it going to be like for followers of Jesus in a society like that? Well, I've heard many of you talk about your workplaces. In the time of Lot, they're building, and they're planting, and they're selling, and they're going about business. Many of you in your workplaces, you tell me how, if you want to get promoted... Usually, it's the guy who's lying, or it's the guy who's putting everyone else down. It's the guy who's kind of manipulating things to put himself ahead, and they get promoted. But as a follower of Jesus, you say, I'm not here just to gain and accumulate life for myself. I want to live a holy life. And in the workplace, I'm not going to play that same game as everyone else. And you're left without the promotion. It's not fair. I did what was right. They cheated and lied and stealed, and they get ahead? That's not just. That's not fair. And yet that's how our society's functioning. Pray for justice. Pray day and night. Cry out to him and say, God, it's not fair. Can you right these wrongs? Can you correct this situation? In the time of Noah, they were marrying and being given in marriage. Singles. Isn't it the view in our society that if you want to get married... You gotta kinda try it out first. So move in together, see if it works. And yet, as a follower of Jesus, you take a stand and you say, No, I'm gonna fight for purity. And in my life, I'm not gonna do what the rest of the world does. And doesn't that put you in a little bit of a hindrance? You wanna get married, but it seems like no one's gonna marry me because I'm not playing that same game that everybody else is playing. And you cry out and you're like, It's not fair. It's not right. I'm obeying God. I'm following him, I'm walking in obedience and purity, and I'm just left to by myself. Pray. Pray for justice. Pray that God rights the wrongs. Pray that God corrects this fallen world. And it's not just when we choose to follow God that we see the injustice of things, but this world is broken. This world is shattered and corrupted and tainted by sin. 
And so when sin entered the world, death came, and with death, our bodies start decaying and dying, and health fails. Cry out to God and say, it shouldn't be this way. I want you to right these wrongs. This world is falling apart, and the world itself is groaning, and so do we, saying, God, restore what's broken in this world. I think of my friends in Tanzania. They were born there, and so they're in poverty. They were born into poverty. They live in poverty. They're going to die in poverty. It's not fair. It's not just. It's not right. And so we cry out to God for justice. When we cry out to God for justice, what does Jesus say? He says, will he delay? I tell you, he will give justice to them, and he'll do it quickly or speedily. He'll do it quickly. Now, quickly and persistence don't really go together, right? If we cry out to God and he has answers us, there's no need to persist in your prayers. So we need to understand what he means by quickly. In Peter, they're asking him, how come Jesus hasn't returned yet? And it says God's not slow in keeping his promise. As we understand slowness, God has a purpose. And when you think of the word quick, Sometimes you think in a hurry. As fast as I can, I'm going to get this done. But you can also think of the word quickly in a different light. You show up at someone's house, and they're like, wow, you're early. You look at your watch, you're like, actually, I'm 10 minutes late. But they're not expecting you, right? And they're, they're busy, and they're doing their thing, and they think you came quickly. And here, God's quickly is more of an unexpected. It's more when it comes, boom, here it is, it's happening. And God says, I'm patiently waiting to... Take away the corruption in this world, the wrongs in this world, the injustice in this world, to right the wrongs. That day is coming, but God's patiently waiting because he's not willing that any should perish. God's giving us a chance. He wants all to come to eternal life, and so he's patiently waiting. But God does promise justice. God promises that one day he will wipe out the corruption in this world. He will wipe out the evil in this world. He will take away everything that's broken he will begin again. He will make all things right. And as followers of Jesus, we can hear that and we can know that that means destruction. That means judgment. But as followers of Jesus, we know that we're secure. Right? Because Jesus has already won the victory. He's been our substitute giving us life. And so when God comes to right the wrongs and we look at our own lives and go, I actually deserve punishment, but Jesus took that for me, and now Jesus has promised me an eternal life in goodness and in hope, and he's given us the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We look forward to that day. We know it'll be a dreadful day when Jesus wipes out all that's broken on the world, but we know it's a day of glorious hope because that'll usher us into a just salvation where all of the wrongs will be made right. Even think of the the martyrs in heaven, Revelation says that they're in heaven now praying, God, when's the day coming for our justice, right? When's that day coming where you're going to right the wrongs of us being killed for our faith? That day will come, and it'll come quickly. And so, when we pray, we pray persistently. We, we base our prayers on the character of God, knowing who he is, and we pray for justice. We pray that God rights the wrongs. And we see that working out at many levels in our lives. And that brings us to the question where Jesus ends us off. Where he says, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus returns, will he find faith on earth? And then he doesn't answer the question because that question is just as important for the disciples in that generation as it is for us and as it will be for future generations if the Lord doesn't yet return. Will he find faith? And really that is a question for us. So I ask, well, will he? Faith and prayer are connected here. And Jesus is saying, he wants to find faith. But is it going to happen? Are you going to be praying persistently and carrying on, growing in your faith, coming to God? Or are you going to get distracted just by eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and harvesting, just the routines of life, trying to gain life, trying to accumulate life, trying to make it work out for yourself? Or are you going to give it all up? Jesus asks, will he find faith? 
And the how to that? We better be asking the how to that, right? The how to that is the prayer persistently. He's saying pray persistently, and if you're praying persistently and you're coming before God again and again and again, will he find faith? Yes, he will. Maybe all of society is going downhill. Maybe there'll be a great turning away from God, but for you, where will you be? Will you be praying? And I think that starts today, right? That starts the here and now. To pray and to keep on praying. And as our prayers grow, our faith grows. Hey, when he returns, he finds faith. And then we have eternal life. And through that, God is eternally praised.